Well, welcome. Happy New Year. Tonight is our first Science Cafe 2024. We made it. So I'm going to go cheers all of you for making it out tonight in this lovely weather. All right. Well, if you don't know me, my name is Nathan. I am a science teacher over at New Bedford High School. I'm ready to go to bed. So, um, as we start our night off, as always, we want to thank the last round for opening up. They open up on Tuesday nights just for us. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you haven't got dinner yet, be sure to order a bite. Grab yourself a beverage or two. And be sure to uh, thank them when we head out tonight. All right. Um, we see a lot of new faces here tonight, which is awesome, so welcome. Raise your hand if it's your first time here. Amazing. If you haven't had a chance to check out yet, go on to our uh, Facebook page. Just do a quick search for New Bedford Science Cafe. You can even Google it. Go to the Facebook page or our weekly page. Click on the um, Stay Informed link. Sign up. We can get our, our monthly emails. Gives you events, any news, and any upcoming science cafes. So it's a way you can stay in touch. All right. Let's see. We are going to go ahead and have our speaker this evening come to us from Holyoke, so kind of local. He's earned a Bachelor's in History from Providence College, a Master of Arts in Colonial History and Historical Archaeology from the College of William and Mary, and he's been busy ever since, working almost 36 years in the National Park Service, engaging visitors across the country from here in Massachusetts to New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, all the way over to Wyoming. And if that's not enough, He's also an adjunct teacher. He coaches high school tennis at, uh, I always say this wrong, Mon Monomoy? Sweet, Monomoy Regional High School. So he's here to speak tonight on excavating the Great Island Tavern Wealth Fleet, a place where Native Americans, whalers, European settlers may have gathered to drink, smoke, socialize from 19, or 1690 to 1740. As he talks tonight, if you can't hear anything, just raise a hand, yell out, we can hear you and we'll make it work. All right, I'd like to introduce Bill Burke. Hi, everybody. I want to thank Nathan and uh, Ann for having the courage to invite a non-scientist to the Science Cafe. How many of you graduated or went to school for the humanities, liberal arts? So tonight we're talking about uh, a 400 year old tavern that no longer exists. It's the best documented tavern in New England, colonial tavern site in New England. But 400 years ago is a long time. It's not 4,000 years ago, but it's definitely more than four years ago. So tonight, I wanted to start off by uh, making a toast that we can all raise our glass to. I have a replica wine bottle from the colonial period made in Jamestown. So it's not old, but it looks just like the ones that were probably used at the Great Island Tavern in Wellfleet. So, all right, here's a toast, a toast to the people who went to Great Island Tavern in 1690, almost 400 years ago. They were Native Americans, they were European settlers. It seems like they were getting along okay, whaling and being very busy uh, colonists or natives. And all I can wish is that their lives were as happy, comfortable, and that their tavern was as warm and hospitable as this one. Okay. Here, here. <laughs> if you want, there is a great uh, work of fiction, The Woman, the Women of Great Island, which is a, a book that you can read, set on Great Island. I haven't read it yet, but I brought it. And then there's a great book I brought called Changes in the Land because a lot of what we're talking about is environmental changes caused by people living in the new world. And this is a great breakdown of that. All right. 
Time is running out. Also, there's a great article in Natural History Magazine from uh, probably about 1970, all about the Great Island Tavern. Yeah. Okay, so we're at the intersection of science and the humanities. We're going to use science tonight to help peel away some of the darkness of 400 years. And you see this on the History Channel and the Science Channel all the time, where you can use technology to get to human history and to peel back some layers. So what is Great Island? How many of you have been to Great Island in Wellfleet? Yay, okay. Well, for those of you who haven't, it is a uninhabited piece of land. It's about two miles long, one mile wide, covered with pitch pine, beautiful trees, open understory. You can hike through it, and it's one of the great hikes at Cape Cod National Seashore. But back in the, the end of the Ice Age, it was a much larger landform. It looked a lot different. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit about Great Island. Uh, back when this was a tavern on, on the island, it was a true island, so you'd have to take a boat out there. Native peoples lived on Great Island for thousands of years. And then the, if you recall those pilgrims, 1620 Plymouth, Remember, some of them got a little fed up with the ho-hum of Plymouth Colony and broke off from Plymouth, and they, some of them went to East Ham, present-day East Ham. Do you remember that story? 1644. Uh, some, these are some of the prominent members of that Plymouth Colony. So they start a new satellite colony that they, they, uh, they eventually call East Ham, and then the north parish of that they call Billingsgate, which later becomes Walfley. Uh, there will be a quiz on this, so I hope you're paying attention. All right. So if you wanted to go to East Ham, the new colony's going. The Native Americans living there are either putting up with the colonists, or they're leaving, or they're getting Christianized. It's kind of a mix of a lot going on there. But the people who were getting a little fed up and a little too tight with people in East Ham then started going up to Billingsgate, where Great Island is, and where present-day Wellfleet is. Because there was great pasture land for your livestock up in the North Parish in Billingsgate. And, and there's a great place to graze your sheep on Great Island. Uh, there was a lot of wood to be cut still, because wood was so essential to culture firewood, small boat building, and everything else. So Great Island and Billingsgate and present-day Wellfleet became very popular with these European settlers. So by 1690, they were already messing up Great Island. Uh, they cut all the trees down on Great Island. But the one thing Great Island had was it was smack dab in the middle of inshore whaling. If you're familiar with those little pilot whales, and they still strand today uh, in mass some, some of the times uh, at the end of storms. So it would appear as though the European settlers and the native people, the Pocanocs, the Pamets, the Nossets, they were hanging out together on Great Island, going and uh, basically herding these pilot whales and forcing them to beach themselves on the beach, and then they'd butcher those whales right there. They'd boil the blubber for oil, and there was this kind of probably a 30, 40 year period of time in which there was some type of establishment or tavern, native peoples teaching European settlers how to inshore whale, harvest whales. These, this is when whales were still abundant within eye shot of shore. And this golden period lasted from about 1680 to 1740. And you didn't have to go to the Pacific to go whaling and deep sea whale. You could still go inshore whaling. So the tavern was there, and the whalers were there, the native peoples were there, the European settlers were there. And this drives historians crazy, this, this contact period. What's so big about contact period? It's a time when two cultures are living 
together is somewhat cooperatively and they're both leaving material culture behind that the archaeology can find. Contact period archaeology is very rare. So you either have an archaeology site that's all Native American, all post, you know, post-colonial time. You rarely get an archaeological collection that has Native American stuff mixed in with European stuff. So take just take it for granted, it's a big deal. All right. <laughs> so the people on Great Island were fishing, they were shell fishing, they were grazing cattle, and they were successful. But then the environment broke down, the land was cut over, and the, the wind and the sand, if you've been to Cape Cod, you know wind and sand are everywhere. And the whole island starts to get covered by sand. In fact, the archaeologists have found sand aeolian, sand deposits, 10 feet vertical feet high, covering the original ground surface. So the amount of sand that's unleashed by the deforestation, the grazing, and so on, uh, creates kind of an economic, uh, environmental crisis. Then all those whales that were being harvested, started to, the numbers started to give out, and now the inshore whaling collapsed. So now you've kind of messed up the island, there's no more trees, the tavern goes out of business, there's no more whales, the whole place is abandoned by 1740. And then from 1740 until Cape Cod becomes kind of popular for tourism, nothing happens on Great Island. A couple of hunting camps, more windblown sand, and that's what we find today. Pitch pines growing up, a lot of sand on the surface, uh, and now we have the beautiful nature of Cape Cod National Seashore. It is the only part of the park that could probably be designated as wilderness area because it has very little human signs of life anymore. All right. So let's talk about the archaeology and the science. <clears throat> All right. So, 1969, Cape Cod National Seashore is just created. We hire two of the greatest archaeologists in New England at that time, James Dietz and Eric Eckholm. They worked for uh, Plymouth Plantation. The National Park Service hired them. They fully excavated Great Island Tavern because all the word of mouth was there was a tavern there. They collected 80,000 artifacts, a lot of mortar, a lot of window glass, a lot of bottle glass, a lot of mug glass, um, shellfish, whale bones. So they pieced it all together in this mammoth report and they said this is what Great Island Tavern was. It was a big tavern serving Native Americans and Europeans. Uh, they, they didn't even talk about Native Americans. European settlers. So 50 years goes by, the interpretation is now different and archaeologists have more tools so, beginning in 2018, we hired the great people at UMass Boston. The, there's a, a center for archaeology called the Fisk Center. And from 2018 to 2021, they went out to Great Island, and I helped them kind of get started with the logistics, because you have to take, it's a long walk to bring your equipment out there. <clears throat> and instead of like digging up everything around the tavern site and doing it the old fashioned way that archaeologists used to do, they use science and new archaeology techniques to try to learn more about what was going on around the tavern. Were there native peoples living around it at the same time? The 1969 archaeologists never even thought that was important. But think of the challenges. 10 vertical feet of sand over some of the original landform. If you're an archaeologist, that's a big problem. Because you want to get down to where human activity was taking place. You don't care about all that windblown sand. The other thing was the coast of that island is shrinking because of coastal erosion, sea level rise. So we had these ribbons of shell middens. These are very thick layers of shell that were deposited by native peoples over long periods of time that hold fish bones and sh all types of shellfish, mammal teeth, 
And these beautiful shellmans are collapsing onto the beach as the cliff erodes on Great Island. So <clears throat> this is what UMass Boston did. They said, OK, we're going to, we didn't let them use a drone, because that's National Park Service doesn't like drones. So they used a kite. <laughs> I kind of felt bad. But there they are. They got the kite, and they're taking multiple images of a stretch of coastline that has these beautiful shell middens. Uh, they're taking over, uh, let's see, taking over 1,200 individual GPS points and total station points. So they're trying to map the island so that the National Park Service knows what's left and what's going pretty soon and maybe what we should try to save. The UMass Boston used ground penetrating radar units. These look like big oversized push lawnmowers and they were, instead of digging up where they thought native sites were around the tavern, they just ran these machines and got a look at even below the Aeolian sand to get a better look at the sites. They also used a lot of radiocarbon dating to date anything that was organic, wood, charcoal, bone shell. Uh, they also did traditional excavation units, one meter by one meter test pits. And so between the ground penetrating radar, the kite survey, uh, the radiocarbon dating, and so on, they came up with some results. Results are as follows. Native peoples lived in and around the tavern site throughout the tavern's history. That was something that the earlier archaeologists didn't care about and didn't know about. Uh, they, the results also indicate that for 1,200 years, the native peoples lived on Great Island, so long before uh, the European settlers were there. The native peoples, OK, this is a little technical, but it is the science cafe. Quote, there was long-term, continuous, dispersed, low-density occupation, repeated short-term use, overlapping the European settlement. <clears throat> One other interesting thing they found was that native peoples had been har harvesting primarily oyster and soft shell clams. But as time went on, they stopped harvesting those, we're not sure exactly why, and they harvested almost exclusively quahog. Maybe for the wampum and the purple and the shell, we're not sure. So the UMass Boston work was profound. It opened us up to a sense of a tavern site that was more than just a tavern for the European settlers. It was a place where the Europeans and natives were living, I guess, in harmony for decades, and that there was probably a transference of knowledge about inshore whaling, shell fishing, and all the other types of activities that were taking place there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Awesome, thank you so much, Bill. We are gonna open this up for some questions and answers. So, if you have a question, just raise that hand, shout it out. Um, we will try to space some people around the room. We will ask if you can just repeat the question for those who can't hear. Sure. All right. Did the report indicate what they were drinking and where they got it? <laughs> yeah, so what were they drinking and what, uh, in what kind of vessels and so on? So, there was a lot of bottle glass. So that would indicate wine. It would also indicate um, probably uh, the hard cider, the different kinds of ales. Um, the archaeologists did not find any serving type vessels. So that calls into question whether this was really a tavern in a commercial sense, or was it just a meeting place? Um, but yeah, it would have been hard cider, wine, ales. Because drinking water was, the early colonists came to learn very early on that drinking water straight up 
uh, was a bad idea. Yeah, but they didn't, they didn't find any uh, remnants of uh, breweries or anything like that. No, no remnants of the actual booze in the bottles. No. Can you repeat the question as it's asked, please? Yeah, so were, were, did, did they find any actual uh, wine or other beverages in vessels during the archaeology dig? And they did not. So we're, we're just using the context of uh, late 17th century America. Yeah. Yes? So were th was there signs of agriculture? Was there corn growing, uh, beans, corn, squash, the traditional late, late period Native American diet? Uh, on Great Island, there's really no sign of agriculture, probably because of the type of soil, the paucity of the soil. The people who lived there were really going after the shellfish and hunting and scavenging whales almost exclusively. However, during the same time period, which is contact period and slightly before, places near there were definitely being farmed by native peoples uh, to, at a large scale. Um, so Native Americans at Cape Cod were definitely farming for the last 1,500 years before present, if not more. Yeah. Um, just wondering if there's been any effort to look into journals from that time, and is there any evidence to cooperate or add color to the archaeological state? Yeah, so uh, isn't there, come on Bill, you're a historian, you're supposed to go after the paper documents, the journals, the diaries, um, but gosh darn it, there's really nothing. <laughs> And that's, you know, so it makes historians feel naked when there's, there's no paper records, or very little. So part of the problem is there was a very large courthouse fire on Cape Cod in the uh, 1800s, and it really destroyed most of the really early property records. And um, so, no, there's, there's no, there's some very circuitous, paper documents that kind of come at it from the side, but there's really only one name associated with the tavern, and that's Samuel Smith. So the local tradition said that there was a sign that used to stand at the trailhead as people would walk out to Great Island when it was finally uh, connected by land. Um, and the sign supposedly said, this is local tradition, and historians hate local traditions. Um, the sign supposedly said, Smith Tavern. How many of you are named Smith? Or it's, and the sign goes on to say, Samuel Smith, he has good flip. Flip is kind of a, an alcoholic beverage. Good toddy, if you please. The way is near and very clear, tis just beyond the trees. So that's one, of the, that's one of the few, it's not even a written document, um, it's a story in a local tradition that this was the Smith Tavern. However, with what little local records we have, there's no indication that there was any kind of commercial license activity on Great Island. So it could have been one of those speakeasies or under the radar establishments. And given the fact it was an island and godforsaken place and really smelly with whale oil, I, it probably was easily under the radar. So it could have been the Samuel Smith Tavern, but then historians have then taken that story of the sign and they've completely ruined it because we, we found Samuel Smith in some records and he doesn't own any land on Great Island until long after the tavern site ended. So I have to say as the historian here that he has nothing to do with the tavern. However, if you think that, that maybe there's a connection, that's fine. 
Yeah. Did the sand help preserve some of the artifacts? And two more quickly. During the period of, of King Philip's War, do you have any any information about what happened in this part of the pod? Okay, a couple of questions. So didn't the sand, the windblown sand, didn't it preserve the archaeology? And the answer is yes. Um, yes. But the problem is trying to get down in there to see what's in there. So they, they use the ground penetrating radar. They use these core auger things where you could go through the sand and keep twisting a very small core down and then pull up the core sample. Uh, so it preserved the site, but it also, it's still very hard to get at the stuff. And then the other question was about the King Philip's War, which starts, I think, in 1675. Um, it does not really directly affect Cape Cod. Uh, that, is a, that is a southeastern New England war between native peoples and colonists. Uh, so I guess fortunately for Cape Cod, there was not a lot of uh, direct casualties or battles with that. Yes? Could you just give us a sense, how is Great Island still an island, and how far is it from the mainland? So Great Island is now so these sandbars have come down from Provincetown and they've connected Great Island to the mainland of Cape Cod. <clears throat> so, how much of a distance is there? so when you go today, you can park your car at the Great Island parking lot and then after about a 45 minute walk, you'll walk across the sandbar, which is dry land, even at high tide, and then up onto Great Island and over to the tavern site. So it's about a 45 minute walk to, to get to the tavern. And you can go to the tavern site today, there's a couple signs. All you'll see is kind of where the Plymouth Plantation archeologists just completely stripped that whole tavern site when they excavated it. Uh, and there's some cobbles from the foundation. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nice hike, or if you have a boat, it's easier. Yeah, so, yeah, what else is on Great Island? So all this activity, there's really, um, so the survey also, so this was fun, you'd love this as a, if you're a scientist or not. Uh, we did a walkover survey of the entire island. So we literally had seven of us, arm length apart, so this island is two miles long, a mile wide, and we walked back and forth in grid fashion. We're doing a ground survey to see if there was other stuff that's visible. Um, there is one site in the center of the island where there's a little spring and a little cranberry bog, and the main trail goes right by it. And there's definitely a Native American site right in the middle of the island. But other than the tavern site and the immediate environs and that one in the middle of the island, there's nothing, there's a couple of hunting camps from the 20th century, the foundations, and that's it. And what's the nature of the Indian site? Is it really sweet? So the, the shell middens are still in the bluff, they're still crumbling down, but the archeologists from UMass Boston preserved Core, big thick cores of that shell midden and it's just layer upon layer probably created over a 10 or 20 year period of soft shell clam, quahog, animal bone, fish bone, some native tools, native ceramic and it's all kind of like it, these are refuse piles so those are still kind of out there if you walk along the beach because the bluff is 70 feet high along the edge of the island so it is a, a magical place to go hike because you can kind of see see these things still. Bill, you didn't mention pirates at all. <laughs> yes, pi pirates. <laughs> yes. I'm from the Cape, so. Okay. So right there was the uh, the widow pirate ship. That's the big one, right? Uh, that one sank, what was it, 1715, 1713. 
sank off a well fleet on the ocean side. Um, I don't think there was any interaction between uh, Bellamy, the Witta, and this tavern, but there could there could be a connection. You know, we had supposedly had the girlfriend who lived in Wellfleet, Goody Hallett. Maybe she had a connection to the tavern. Maybe she worked at the tavern. Um, but no other pirate connection to Great Island. Believe me, if I could find one, I would have said something. <laughs> Everybody loves pirates. Yes. Yeah. Has any evidence been found? about docks adjacent to that area because there was a lot of product that they were selling. So I was curious whether there was, was dockage that had been discovered. We've, yeah, we've never uh, discovered any, of the, any kind of docks that some of the boats or ships would have used. And this even goes, if you go further past Great Island moving south, you go to Great Beach Island, you go to Billingsgate Island, and Jeremy Point. That, that is like the furthest south you can go and along all this stretch, and this is a good seven mile stretch, and it's a great hike at low tide, by the way. Um, no, no signs of, you know, those, a lot of, our, a lot of organic materials on Cape Cod and, and New England in general deteriorate fast because of the salt water and because of the acidic soil. So, there's not a lot of old wharfs that would have been in use, say, during the tavern, no. Yes, Anne. Yeah. So what about the clay pipes? Um, and also, could you give a little history of the clay pipes? Also, there are 80,000 artifacts, that's a lot. Where, yeah. where are they at this point? Yeah, all right, so 80,000 artifacts. So where the heck do you keep 80,000 artifacts? Uh, in a big building. Um, <laughs> in a lot of little boxes and a lot of Ziploc bags. So I think archeologists keep the Ziploc industry going, uh, but that, that's, they, are, they are stored away in a storage building in Truro. And that's one of my jobs at the National Seashore. I'm, I'm the curator and we keep track of all the stuff. It's actually all 80,000 artifacts, which sound like a lot. Those were all taken by our, uh, some specialists from the regional office and the Park Service, and they are reanalyzing the 80,000 artifacts. And they are putting new baggies and new boxes. So if you think you've got a monotonous job, I think about that, 80,000 artifacts. Um, so, and if anyone ever wants to see them, you contact me, talk to Ann or Nathan, and if you come to Cape Cod, we'll, we'll give you a good time, show you around. There was a question Ann had about the pipes. So you all know the clay pipes, here's a pipe bowl, held the tobacco, had the long stem, so you'd have it in your mouth and it came out to like here, right? And this was during the Great Island Tavern period and before and after, clay pipes were really popular. Smoking tobacco was very popular, and taverns in particular. So there was over, of the 80,000 artifacts found at Great Island Tavern, about 1,200 of them were pieces of either pipe bowls or the stem pieces, right? So you're like, okay, so what? So I'll tell you why it's important. Uh, first of all, all these pipes were made in England and there were millions of them created. And they are a perfect way to date archaeology sites. Not by the design of the pipe bowl, but by the stem, which has the little hole in which you suck, suck on to get the smoke. And that little pipe stem bore is very scientific for archaeologists. Because that bore, so the factories in England are so well documented. Some of the bowls have little imprints on them, maker's marks. But that little hole starts off very narrow in the first years of production, late 1500s. By the 18th century, the hole gets bigger, and it's done incrementally when they are manufacturing the kaolin clay used to make these pipes. So an archaeologist, if 
if you were an archaeologist and I gave you this pipe stem, you would pull out your little pipe stem guide with the pipe stem diameter diagram. Are you glazing over yet? <laughs> and you could date the site to within five years of when that smoker used that pipe. That's how exciting pipe stem diameter. And I'm only excited. It took me a lot of therapy and, and a lot of time. But we have an archaeologist, a colleague of mine, and he specializes in pipe stem diameters. And God, God willing, the pipe stems found, the 1,200 pipe stems found at Great Island, using the bore diameter, date the site, 1680, and it absolutely collapses with the number after 1740. And that jives with the destruction of firewood and the killing off of the onshore whales. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, goals for the research was to try to establish um, fully a full picture of who was using Great Island and when. The, the other thing that's going on is, and I forgot to mention this, when UMass Boston went out in 2018 and they were doing the ground penetrating radar, the radiocarbon, all, they had with them two members of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. And they were collaborating with the tribe, talking about, hey, what does this landform look like to you? What does this assemblage of, of shell in this particular part of a shell mean? What, what does that resonate with you? Um, so I think part of the goal of any archaeology in New England is to try to get the native story and the voice. And the native story really is the predominant story and voice really for this site. So I don't know if that answers any of your questions, but it's really important to do this. It's also very hard to do, and it's very frustrating to do. I'll just speak from working as a bureaucrat in the National Park Service. To collaborate with tribes is so important, but it's difficult because we, we all have different staffing levels, agendas, ways of doing business, communicating, all that. Um, so really, that's one of the great takeaways from this project was collaboration with Native people. Um, Native people have a long oral tradition, and they don't, they don't look at history as a Western-trained historian like myself, where you look at paper documents and archaeology. They look for the oral tradition of their people, and they interpret the landscape, the whales, and all that in, a, in just a different, completely different mindset than historians. So that's a long answer. But we'll go back to the bar. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So is there an oral tradition? Weren't, weren't the tribes decimated? So to answer your question best I can quickly, uh, in the Plymouth area where Plymouth Colony started, the Patuxet Village, uh, it's estimated that 90 to 95 percent of all native peoples died from either smallpox or measles. We're not exactly sure what, but exposure to Western diseases by early European contact 90 to 95% of those people were dead by the time Mayflower sails into Plymouth Harbor. However, not the case on Cape Cod from what we can tell. Maybe because Cape Cod sticks out and had earlier exposures for longer periods of time. I'm just spitballing here, but um, 
Cape Cod did not experience, and the Nasa peoples did not experience a cataclysmic collapse of population. So, and, and the Mashpee Wampanoag and the Gay Hedequinna Wampanoag are direct descendants of those peoples who lived in the Great Island Tavern, East Ham area, and they have an oral tradition that helps, in their minds, clarify the history of that place. Um, and if they say they've got it, they got it. I, yeah. I, I might have just request somebody else's question, but did you find any money? <laughs> um, do we find any money? That's one of the best ways to date a site, right? It's got a coin with a date. Um, supposedly there was a coin found by the Plymouth Plantation people in 1969, but I don't see many references to it. It had a date of um, 1653 or something. The, the thing with coins is that maybe it's a really old coin and then it finally was dropped. So you can't date the site necessarily 1653. It's gonna be later than that. But no, didn't have really have any coins. Yeah. People were careful with their money. They broke a lot of bottles, but they, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, was there any attempt to use the artifacts or what they were to discover about population and in terms of how big the, was it a seasonal population only? Like, did the Native Americans only come there in the, in the summer? Yeah. You know, and were, was the European population more year round? Did you have any estimates? How many yeah, time? so populations, how do you get to the populations uh, without paper records and, and town records? So the Native population's been estimated in the Wellfleet area of probably a by 1690, probably a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred native peoples living in and around Great Island and Wallfleet. In the summer or the winter? So when, what time of year? So this is where shellfish comes in, because you can look at the way shellfish, I'm a historian, not a scientist, but the way shellfish works is they have growth patterns. and you can look at a piece of shell from the beach and you can tell when that shell was harvested by the thickness of the growth rings. So to answer your question, there was year-round use in shell fishing and consuming of shellfish year-round at Great Island. It wasn't just in the summer. And that's a change from probably a couple thousand years before then when native peoples were really more moving seasonally inland in the winter, coastal in the summer. By, by contact period and even earlier, the shellfish analysis indicates year-round use of shellfish stocks. Ooh. All right, how about, yeah, go ahead. Uh, getting back to the ground country and radar. So you know where the site is where the tavern was. Um, is, is there evidence that there are still foundation pieces or other things that are underground that locate exactly? Is there anything that marks the site at this time? Yeah, so the Great Island Tavern Foundation, the archaeologists in 1969, they, they created a, a definite blueprint floor plan of where exactly the tavern was. When you go out there today, it's kind of delineated by some of these big cobblestones that were used for the foundation, but it's not really clear to the average person out there. Um, they do determine, based on how much mortar they found, how much brick they found, they were able to estimate the square footage of said structure, which is interesting. I think it was 2,500 square feet, pretty decent size for that time. But no, there's no other existing foundation stuff. Because this UMass Boston stuff, recent, they were like, tavern's already been documented. We're, we're, we're going beyond that to get to the more interesting stories of what's happening around the tavern. There's a question over here. Was there any evidence of the tavern being used for lodging or strictly a place to just get a drink? For yeah, was the tavern used for lodging? We don't know and there was, there's really no evidence there. I'm guessing yes because it was a pain to get out there. <laughs> and once you got out there, yeah. We're so lucky to have Bill here tonight because he's been, you know, the historian and kind of archaeologist too on the seashore for so long. I can't help but ask a question. 
what your favorite finding after all these years, I know you've talked about this in other talks, but um, sort of the relics that you've found along the seashore aside from this tavern that have interested you. So, yeah, what's the coolest thing that I've been, that I have found? I do have a lot, uh, I'd say once a week, a visitor comes into the center and they, they're like, okay, Bill, what is this? And what is that? And is it important? Um, yeah, I'm not gonna answer it the way you think. So, I had a person come in from New Jersey and, and he had, his family had been coming to Cape Cod since the 30s. And he brought in his photo album, and it showed the early ways that people came to Cape Cod from a distance. And it was, those photos are so cool, because it, it showed, if you've been to Cape Cod or lived there, you know that it's so expensive to live, and everyone wants a piece of it. But back in the 30s and 40s, people would just head out to Cape Cod, and they would just hang out by the beach and on the bluff, and it was just such a more informal way to enjoy the place. And the stories that he had with the, with the pictures, and I helped him create like his own little family book. It's not published. So I would say that was probably the, it was just such a innocent way of looking at the old Cape Cod. And so refreshing, because it's so intensely lived on now. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Is there any evidence that there are any other structures out there? I mean, like, is it all Indians that bought this, or are there white people out there? Yeah, so in terms of what's left on, Cape, on Great Island, there, again, th this is a lesson for all of us. It, you think we're all important and we're all leaving a permanent mark, but things really disappear and deteriorate really fast. Yeah, have you ever gone away from your house for like a month and you come back? It's already starting, right? Uh, trees have fallen on the roof, right? The gutters are closed. So it's different because we have permanent materials like concrete and steel, and they're not permanent permanent, but they're pretty durable. Um, but think about it. Um, all, all thousands of years of native peoples living on Cape Cod, the only thing left, not just Great Island, is anything that didn't deteriorate in the acidic soil. So you have really no organics left. There's no bone tools, there's nothing made out of leather, there's nothing made out of wood, it's gone. Fence posts, we twos, gone. So all that's left is kind of skews the brain because all it is is stone tools, some native ceramic, which is rare on Cape Cod, and really, it's kind of about it. The landform fills in or gets washed over. So we are all living in a very temporal world. And you think about it, native peoples lived on Cape Cod for 10,000 years. And there's really nothing left except bone and a little bit of ceramic and a, li and a little bit of stone tools. Makes you think, are we that important? <laughs> so, I guess we'll go with one more question. Or we'll just What's the evidence that they were inhabiting Cape Cod as far back as 10,000 years ago? How do you, what is the dating mechanism that it had turned into the Cape Cod that we know today? Yeah, this is highly debated. How, how many years ago did Native Americans first come to Cape Cod? So you have to look at the ice sheet, and it was retreating, and so geologists kind of have that figured out. So you gotta look at the archeology span record. There are native stone tools that were found in Bass River in Yarmouth, up against the trunk of a tree, that were from the Paleo period. Somewhere between eight and 10,000 years ago, and we know that because there's, the book is out on that stone tool design and shape and all that. So the problem is, is the Cape Cod landform was 20 miles wider than it is today, or more. So native peoples were living on the coast. And if all your coast has been eroded away thousands of years ago, all you're left is with is these interior pockets of land that weren't desirable. So 
but there are a small few assemblages of stone tools that date to the Paleo period. If you ask the Mashpee Wampanoag, they were definitely, will say, 12,000 years ago, we were here on Cape Cod, we were right on the edge of the ice sheet, uh, we were hunting the mastodon and other animals that we know were here. Um, it was probably a really tough life, very different from the life during that contact period. The climate was really cold. Um, it was just a completely different. Yeah. Paleo, one thing I've learned is that they'll say 12,000 years of existence. Okay, that's fine, but so different. 12,000 years ago versus 2,000 versus 1,000. These are the way people developed technologies. The climate was so much colder, animals were different, everything. So. Um, he was kind enough to let us twist his arm a little bit, so if you do have some more questions and you want to stay after a little bit, feel free to ask away. Um, be sure to thank the bartenders, kitchen staff in the back, thank you as well for providing us some drinks and some food tonight. We have a little gift here for you from the Science Cafe. Awesome. So, um, next month's Science Cafe will be on Tuesday, February 6th. Uh, we will have Sarah Grady here, she's the Senior Coastal Ecologist for Mass Audubon. She's going to be speaking on the oldest blue bloods, horseshoe crab ecology and management. So be sure to come out for that. Again, if you don't follow us on Facebook or you want to join the mailing list, do a quick Google search for New Bedford Science Cafe. Join that Get Involved link and you'll be able to sign up for our email list to get future events, any events going on in the city that we're a part of, so you have all that information. Um, one last thing as we wrap up, we know the holiday season just came and went. We can still be kind to each other. So go out there tonight, be safe on your way home in the weather. Be kind, be safe. We'll see you next month.